to worship with First Baptist Church of Martinsville. We are overjoyed that you have found space to worship among us this morning. I especially welcome our guests here with us today. We are so glad that you have joined us. If you haven't already, please take a moment to fill out a connection card and hand it to a greeter before you leave today as we'd love to connect with you and your family in new ways after worship and in the days to come. We are so glad that you have found a space among us for worship and faith community today. I have a few announcements for us today. First, we welcome our retired pastor, Reverend John Fulcher with us to our pulpit today while our pastor is away on vacation. We look forward to hear your message. Also, our WMU thanks you for your generosity for the Alma Hunt Virginia Missions Offering this year. Our church members raised $1,357, and the Missions Committee provided the remaining balance of our goal of $2,222. WMU of Virginia and Baptist General Association of Virginia will do great work with your generous giving. Also, our Missions Committee and WMU remind you that we have two ongoing missions collections. We continue to gather items and fill play pails for disaster relief. Please grab a bucket in the narthex and fill it and bring it back for delivery to God's pit crew by the end of October. And we continue to gather items for Patrick Henry Elementary Food Pantry, delivering these items weekly so kids have the food they need over the weekends during the school year. We also have just a couple more days to gather snacks for a Raceway Ministry Tent for the October race. Please drop these off in the missions room by this Tuesday, October 24th. Also, this Friday, October 27th, is our Shared Harvest Fest with Chatham Heights Baptist, held again in our church parking lot, and we still need volunteers. We need decorated trunks and candy for trunk or treat to help with setup and takedown, help with crafts and games and more. There'll be a sign-up sheet in the Narthex today and um, for the church office during the week. So sign up to help so we can create a safe and fun space for families to celebrate and have fun this fall. Also, lastly, the Martinsville Henry County Warming Center will begin its work serving the needs of our neighbors experiencing homelessness during the winter months on November 1st. We will once again be gathering needed items, providing volunteers and bus drivers as well as taking any monetary donations you might want to provide this season. We will be sharing more information about this next week in our bulletin, and we already have information in your East newsletter and on our bulletin board. It is a good day to serve with First Baptist Church, and I hope you'll join us as we love God and love and serve our neighbors. Neil, will you join me as we read our call to worship? You'll find it, find it printed in your bulletin. Though there are rulers, presidents, kings, and queens, God is the Lord of all life. In God we live and do and have our reading. God requires our faith, faithfulness and our service. We reach out to others with the same kind of love with which God has touched our lives. Come. Let us worship the Lord who is always with us. Let us praise God who walks daily by our side. Wonderful are your works, O God. You made us in your image. We are your creation. Our lives are in your hands. You have searched us and known us. You know our thoughts. Your presence cheers us when the burdens of our hearts are too many. Your dreams inspire us when the cares of our hearts are too heavy. Your word enlightens us when attitudes of our hearts are too hardened. Move among us this day, O God. 
Where we are barren of faith, perform your miracle of truth. Where we are barren of love, perform your miracle of grace. Where we are barren of hope, perform your miracle of renewal. Now receive our worship in the name of the one who taught us to pray, saying, Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses, as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil, for thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever. Amen. I invite you to stand as you are able and to join as we sing hymn number 50. Sing praise to God who reigns above, hymn number 50. the gospel. Our gospel lesson comes from Matthew chapter 22, verses 15 through 22. Then the Pharisees went and plotted to entrap him in what he said. So they sent their disciples to him along with the Herodians saying, teacher, we know that you are sincere and teach the way of God in accordance with truth and show deference to no one, for you do not regard people with partiality. Tell us then what you think. Is it lawful to pay taxes to the emperor or not? 
But Jesus, aware of their malice, said, Why are you putting me to the test, you hypocrites? Show me the coin used for the tax. And they brought him a denarius. Then he said to them, Whose head is this and whose title? They answered, The emperor's. Then he said to them, Give therefore to the emperor the things that are the emperor's, and to God the things that are God's. When they heard this, they were amazed, and they left him and went away. The Gospel of our Lord. Praise be to you, O Christ. Please be seated. Come up and join me. Come on up. Good morning. Good morning. How are y'all doing this morning? Good. Good. Now, here I've got this. What? Is, what well, that's what I was going to ask. What do you think this is? It's golden. Oh, it's golden? Like, like my shoes. shoes. Oh, kind of? My, my looks shoes like look golden. A pot? It looks like where God serves food. Where God serves food? And, and a carpet inside of There's it. There's a very nice felt inside. What do you, do you know? We use this during our service. Do you know what we use it for? We and use it for the... the uh, the, with the crackers and the drinks on. Oh, for communion? That was a good guess. That was a good and, guess. And it's really soft on it. <laughs> it is very soft inside. What? We use it for the symbols. For the symbols? Like for a reminder of symbols. For a reminder of symbols? There's a bit of symbolism in this. So we use this, this is called an offertory plate, and we use this to collect money during our service. Why? Yeah. Why? Why? Why would we collect money during the service? Why would we do that? What do you think we'd use the money for? So we could share it? So we could share it? Very good. So, so, so we can help other people? So we can help other people. What would our money that we collect, what, would, what could it do to help other people? It help people in need. Help people in need? What might they need, they, do you they think? They might need they, food, shelter, water, anything. Food, or, shelter, water? Yeah. Or, or cleaning up. Or cleaning up? Some help cleaning up? Yeah. So that, that's really important, that when we're blessed, that we help other people, too, and share those blessings. So during, when we um, bring the offering forward in church, we always sing a song. In almost any church you go to, they'll sing the same song. And y'all might recognize it, and you might not, but congregation definitely knows it. Be, be, and so, because because they, they hope together, and they, and they love all people. Yes, when we share, we show and help others and love all people. That's very good. So I'm going to teach y'all a song. I'm not sure if you know it. And we're going to break it up um, so we get all the words. And this song is all about praising God for the blessings we have and praying oh, that they bless others. Syllables. Syllables. Oh, you symbols for our songs? Yeah, with the syllables, you know it's down. Oh, yeah. Silent, you could just, we could just say the sound of the word that says silent. Yeah. And, 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 then, and then they say this, help other people, and, and, and we don't kill spiders outside because, because spider lives out there. Yeah, we got to be nice to God's creation, right? Mm -hmm. Okay, so repeat after me. Praise God. Praise God. From whom all, From whom all blessings, flow. blessings flow. Praise God. Praise God. All creatures. Heavenly host, the heavenly host. 
choir. <laughs> I did <get> this choir. <laughs> Yeah, so we sing that song to thank God for the blessings. Yeah, so let's Yeah, so let's join in prayer. Will y'all bow your heads with me? Repeat after me, dear God. Thank you for all of your blessings. And help us to help others. In your name we pray. Amen. Very good. Okay. That's all. I invite you to stand as you are able and to join as we sing. Hymn number 649, We Give Thee But Thine Own. Hymn number 649. Jesus said, give to Caesar the things that are Caesar's and give to God the things that are God's. All we have and all we are has come from God. So let us worship him today with our offerings. Will you pray with me? Our loving God, we thank you for protecting us in our daily lives by providing an ordered and peaceful existence. Help us to respect the governing authorities, but above all, lead us to honor and obey you, O Lord, and to serve you with all that you have given us. Amen. I invite you to stand for the doxology.
Some of you might have noticed I kept this with me, my notes, the whole time. Back in the day, it's been a long time ago, uh, one time my notes were hidden from me before the sermon. They did show up at the last minute. Then another time, I opened my notes and the pages were all scrambled. Now, it could have been Brian, it could have been Craig. I'll let you guess which one did that. <laughs> Maybe one did one and one did the other. Will you pray? May the words of my mouth and the meditations of our hearts be acceptable to you, O God, our strength and our redeemer. Amen. A recent survey of Christian congregations revealed that most people hoped the Sunday sermon, not only would keep them awake, would show them how a particular biblical text touched and informed their individual lives. Today's text can do just that. But in that text that Judy read, just what happened? It was the last week of Jesus' life on earth. He has been in the temple in Jerusalem since Monday, teaching all who would listen. A little background will help. Jesus drew quite an audience when he preached or taught. The crowds, who made up about 25, uh, 95 percent of the population, as well as the Jewish elite, who made up about 5 percent of the population, among the elite were scribes, elders, aristocracy, and Sadducees. There were other groups. The teachings of Jesus were quite popular with the crowds, while the elites just mentioned thought he was a dangerous threat to the nation and to them personally. In our story for today were representatives of two other groups who opposed Jesus, the Pharisees and the Herodians. Pharisees were experts in Jewish law, or Torah, and they did their best to keep every word of it. In general, they were admired by the crowds. The Herodians supported the status quo and the rule of Herod Antipas, son of Herod the Great. These two groups were normally at odds with one another, for you see, Pharisees resented Roman occupation of Judea, while the Herodians were growing rich from it. They received their power and support from Rome. These members of the Jewish upper class opposed Jesus because he challenged their power, their wealth, and their authority. He just might turn the crowds against them. He might even cause an insurrection, which the empire would not tolerate. Pilate had done that some years earlier, and quite a few were crucified. It, it was a terrible thing. The Pharisees opposed the way Jesus interpreted parts of the law. In their view, he broke a number of Jewish laws, including the Sabbath law. You're probably familiar with those passages. But they also thought he ran with the wrong crowd. Pharisees and Herodians, though, were united by their opposition to this young rabbi, who had been stirring up trouble all around town, and especially in the temple. Jesus was upsetting the apple cart. He continually challenged their assumptions. From their perspective, Jesus was a nobody. Just who did he think he was? This itinerant preacher was turning the world upside down. In today's encounter, we find a clash between the kingdom of heaven, or the kingdom of God, as revealed in Jesus, and the kingdoms of this world, represented by the Jewish elite and their overlords in Rome. Ironically, Jesus was not there primarily to topple the empire, but eventually his followers did just that. In this verbal exchange, we're at a point where things between Jesus and the Jewish authorities were really getting tense. The storm clouds were gathering. So these two groups, Herodians and Pharisees, conspired to challenge Jesus. Never a good idea. This was the first of three attempts by the powers to do so. They had an agenda and came up with a question they thought would be the perfect trap. After some fake flattery, they asked, tell us then, what do you think? Is it lawful to pay taxes to the empire or not? Well, they thought they had Jesus in a bind. If he says yes, the crowd could likely turn on him. If he says no, the Jewish elite would report him to Rome as an enemy of the state. Jesus often kept those who would challenge him off balance. 
he often answered their questions with more profound questions, suggesting that they were asking the wrong questions altogether. But this question was clever. His response, though, was truly inspired. First, Jesus calls them hypocrites and then asks them for denarius, a Roman coin engraved with the image of the emperor. The coin also was engraved with these words, Tiberius, emperor, son of God. Well, how could an observant Jew even have such a blasphemous coin in his possession? But they had one, handed it to Jesus, and he said, whose head is this and whose title? They answered, the emperor's. Then he said, give therefore to the emperor the things that are the emperor's, and to God the things that are God's. They were amazed, and they left him and went away. And who could blame them? It's interesting that this te text addresses matters of politics and faith. It's also difficult. Like a number of things Jesus said, the meaning of the words is hard to explain and pin down. It's also hard to know exactly what he meant. And in this case, I think there's more than one point. As one writer put it, money, politics, and religion, oh my. Now that's two movie references. I don't know whether you got the first one or not, but that's the second one. I know you know that one. The last two, politics and religion, are hot topics today and often avoided in polite conversation. The first part of Jesus' answer is fairly easy to understand. Give to the emperor the things that are the emperor's. In other words, pay your taxes. Be a good citizen. Paul tells the Romans that later. This wouldn't set too well with the crowd because they deeply resented Roman occupation, and we would too. First century Jewish males paid a number of taxes, temple taxes, land taxes, customs taxes, and the tax in question was called the imperial tax. Proceeds paid for the Roman occupation of Israel. They were actually paying those who oppressed them, that's a bit humiliating, don't you think? Yet, Rome did provide certain amenities that improved their lives. Roman soldiers were quite serious about Pax Romana, as Jews learned earlier, the peace of Rome. Jews did not have to be worried about attacks from other countries. They were protected by what has been called the most powerful army in the world at that time. Romans were renowned for their engineering skills. They built an impressive highway system that connected most parts of the known world. Control of vast territories facilitated trade and economic development across the empire. Travel was made simpler and probably safer. Aqueducts carried clean water to those who needed it. One called the Jerusalem Aqueduct was well known in the first century. I would not have known that if I hadn't had chat GBT I just couldn't imagine an aqueduct in Jerusalem, but there was one there. Well, their legal system emphasized concepts of justice, equality, and due process that continue to influence our own legal system. Roman rule wasn't always benevolent, though, and the benefits varied by region and time period. Yet several decades later, St. Paul seemed to be proud of his own Roman citizenship. In the time of Jesus, the Romans and Jews barely tolerated one another. Still, Judea certainly gained a few things from the relationship. Fast forward to our day. You and I are expected to pay our taxes. And while many, if not most of us, don't enjoy it, I think we would agree we do gain quite a bit from what we pay. In the first century, Jews who failed to pay the imperial tax and were caught would have been treated quite harshly. Roman justice could also be swift and cruel. Broadly speaking, we are reminded that while we Baptists historically have drawn a distinct line between church and state, we are still called to be involved with political issues. We are citizens of two kingdoms, the kingdom of God, as Matthew puts it, the kingdom of heaven, and the political kingdom in which we live. Problems arise when our own sense of right in the world does not mirror what the government or others around us believe. Thus, hot topics emerge. Immigration, abortion, capital punishment, 
democracy versus autocracy. It is good that we examine our own beliefs, beliefs and how we feel about current events. It is also good to remember that practicing Christians may degree, disagree about difficult issues. As members of the body of Christ, we are called to work toward building God's kingdom, which also involves establishing justice in this society, and for that matter, around the world. It can be quite a challenge to interact with governing authorities and yet maintain our calling and identity as Christians. Americans who speak out may make enemies, even receive death threats. Remember, Jesus experienced the same thing. Start talking about current events and friends and family members may suddenly become distant. I have a cousin who won't text me anymore. But here's a good question to consider. Can we trust that God is at work in those who strongly believe differently than we do? Sometimes we may feel we can't really change things. The problems in this world are too big and complex. Just look at the Middle East at the moment. And at the moment, over 40 armed conflicts are going on around the world. <coughs> our text gives us an opportunity to remember we are called to be citizens of two kingdoms. But as Jesus reminds us in another passage, we cannot serve two masters. Jesus is our savior. Jesus is also our Lord. Yet we struggle with the difficult issues of the day and easily grow frustrated. In response, one pastor and author wrote the following, which I have paraphrased. As soon as we think our voice cannot be heard or that it will be silenced anyway, as soon as we think resistance is futile, there's another movie reference, as soon as we think our phone calls to our representatives and senators will come up unheard and landing in a voicemail box, as soon as we think racism, homophobia, xenophobia, and anti-Semitism and other isms are so deeply embedded our efforts to speak up and speak out will not do any good. We are to remember that in several parables told by Jesus, persistence is one of the major tools for building the kingdom of God. Persistence is so incredibly important. The second part of Jesus' answer is more difficult. Give to God the things that are God's. Well, now, just what does this mean? Pastor and author David Lose writes that there are three ways to go with this text. The first I partly covered, and the children helped this morning. As citizens of both kingdoms, we are called to be involved. Oops, I, I said it wrong. Back up a minute. As citizens of both kingdoms, we are called to be involved with political issues, as uncomfortable as that may be. Others may be more political, warning us to be wary of would-be emperors in our world today urging loyalty first to the kingdom of God. Still other preachers go along with our children this morning to remind congregations that all things belong to God and make it a stewardship sermon, urging Christians to be more generous. After all, what do we have that does not belong to God already, including ourselves? These are probably legitimate interpretations, but Dr. Lowe's takes it in a slightly different, but I think profound direction, and connects this passage to the first part of Genesis, chapter one, verse 26. Then God said, let us make humankind in our image according to our likeness. I suspect Jesus had this text in mind. You see, the word likeness in the Greek Old Testament comes from the word icon, as does the word head used by Matthew. So in effect, Jesus asks his challengers whose likeness is on this coin. Maybe Jesus is asking, are you made in God's likeness or the emperor's likeness? Dr. Luce writes, we bear God's likeness and are therefore made to be more than we sometimes realize or often realize. You and I are not called to be pagan gods who lord, lord authority over other humans, but rather to serve the God we worship. 
the one who creates and sustains and nurtures and redeems and saves. When Jesus calls his challengers hypocrites, a word which means actor in Greek, he may be suggesting that the religious elite are simply actors playing their parts, pretending to be God's chosen, and they may not even re realize it. Maybe they have forgotten to whom they belong, though, and in whose likeness they were made. In short, you and I are charged to be like the God we see in Christ Jesus, creating, sustaining, nurturing, redeeming, saving everyone, everywhere, whether we happen to like them or not. What this means for our daily lives, our attitudes, choices, and actions is sometimes quite a challenge. This much we know for certain. Whatever we say or do, we are to live in a way that reflects the likeness of God, remembering that all we have and are and hope to be belongs to God. As Christians, you and I are part of God's family. Pray that others may see in us the family resemblance. Amen. I invite you to stand as you are able as we sing our song of response, number 578, Come All Christians Be Committed, number 578. <clears throat> Now will you receive the benediction. Namely, the love of our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ, in fellowship and communion with the Holy Spirit, abide with each and all of you throughout this day, this week, and forevermore. Amen.